Our God and our Father, we are so grateful to you for this time that we have. Father, for the, the very breath of life that you've put within us. The intellect that you've given us with which we can search your wisdom in your word. That we can understand who you are and who you are calling us to be. God, we just pray that as we look into your word tonight, that we will grow closer to you, that we will grow to be better servants, and Father, that we would always be seeking the truth in your word and trying to apply that in our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We are in Mark chapter 14. We had Mark chapter 13, which was a lot of very deep material. Now we have Mark chapter 14 that is just a lot of material. Uh, not that there's not depth here, but uh, it's 72 verses in this chapter. And the aim is the first 31 tonight, and then the rest uh, two weeks from tonight. Well, we start in chapter 14 with... Uh, Kind of a continuance of what we've already seen. In the first two verses, it says, Now, the Passover and unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and kill him. For they were saying, Not during the festival, otherwise, there might be a riot of the people. That's the definition of evil scheming right there. Uh, before or after, but but he, he has to die. It can't be during the feast, or we might have a riot on our hands. Uh, throughout his ministry, Jesus has talked about time. From the wedding in Cana, when his mother said, fix it, and he said what? It's not my time. And when they tried to push him off a cliff and kill him, he was able just to turn and walk back through the, the crowd because it was not his time. Well, he's already pronounced that his time is near, that he was marching toward Jerusalem for the purpose of giving himself as a sacrifice. And now the time is here. If you have to hide something, is it probably evil? They didn't want to do it in plain sight. They, they wanted to, to get him secretly. They didn't want everybody to know what was going on or there might be a riot. They're not afraid of sinning. They're not afraid of murder. They're not afraid of anything, but they're afraid of the people. Well, the people of Jerusalem, we don't know about all through history, but at this time, they were a problem. Not just a problem for God. They were a problem for the Roman rulers who were trying to rule over them. They were a problem for the chief priests. They were a problem for all these folks because if they got mad about something, there was no stopping them. So this evil scheme was devised. It wasn't don't break the law of God. It was they don't want trouble from the people. So... That kind of starts this introduction of darkness. We've had a lot of light. We've had a lot of, of good. And now we see the plan of God. Don't misunderstand me. These people aren't overruling the plan of God. But they are being used by God because of the evil and the hatred that is in their heart to accomplish what, what had to be done. Well, beginning in verse 3, we kind of get more into the narrative. And this is, this is one of my favorite stories, and I don't know why. But beginning in verse 3, it says, While he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume, nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? 
For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them. But you do not, not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body before the burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken in memory of her. I love that. Now, this is the house of who? Simon the leper. Who is he now? Simon the clean. Simon the used to be leper. So this was the house of, now it's Simon instead of outside the camp and unable to connect with anybody. This is Simon with a house full of people. And that, that alone is, is a beautiful thing. But Jesus was anointed with very expensive perfume. Uh, and we think of perfume and we think of the, the liquidy stuff that's mostly alcohol that people spray on themselves, right? That's not what this was. This was nard. It was pure nard. It would have been, <laughs> it would have been kind of sticky. It would have been very thick. It would have been nothing like what we think of as perfume. But one thing that it was, was very, very costly. Who said that could have been sold? It was Judas. We, we know that not from here, but we know that from Matthew. Why did he say that? <laughs> well, do y'all remember? When... Uh, he was accused of greed back in John chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. It said that he kept the, the purse for the money for the poor, and he did what? He reached in, didn't he? He took what he wanted out of there. He was skimming money. Try to wrap your mind around this. He, he's embezzling money from the treasury of the money that has been given to Jesus for his ministry. I've heard a lot of people make a lot of excuses and try to end around in a lot of ways, but if we just stopped there, if he had never done what we're going to see him do tonight, if he had never done anything else, that alone is shocking. That alone is, it's just unimaginable. Did Jesus know? He knew the intention of the heart of men who he did not know, who came to accuse him. He knew the inclination and the questions that people had. Did he know that Judas was stealing from him? Of course. But Jesus didn't even address that. When this comes up, he doesn't even address the fact that the one who's raising this, this objection is stealing from him. He, he instead addresses the action of the woman. We know it's Mary, like I said, from, from other accounts, but Jesus didn't address this. And I, I always think back to to that old saying about you'll never get anywhere if you stop to throw rocks at every dog that barks. If Jesus was trying to deal with all the evil that was around him and, and even in the heart of Judas, he would have missed the opportunity to point out the thing that he calls beautiful that this woman did. Because unknowingly, now, she knew that she wanted to do something. She knew that she wanted to sacrificially give and do all that she could. Ah, but she didn't know that she was anointing his body for burial, did she? Well, we started out 
back in those first couple of verses, we're two days out from what? The Passover. And before the Passover comes, what's going to happen? He's going to be buried, isn't he? Jesus didn't address that. He addressed this, this thing that this woman did and said that it would always be told. Wherever the gospel was proclaimed, Jesus said that this would be told. How important is that? That wherever the gospel is proclaimed, this, this is going to be taught. That's, that's amazing. Well, Wednesday, March 31st, in the year 33, is the best we can come up with. That's, that's what people who are a whole lot smarter than I am say was the day when this came to, that this was said. Here we are March, I mean, here we are Wednesday, December 2nd, 2020 in Edmond, Oklahoma. We are removed by 1,987 years, eight months and two days, 6,856 miles from where this happened and when this happened and what are we talking about tonight? That should give us that should, that should make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. That should give you goosebumps. That is amazing. Jesus said it, so of course it is. But instead of addressing the evil that was in the room at this point, it, not that he ever shied away from addressing evil, but he took this opportunity to not steal any of the light away from what she had done. Now, who was this? It was Mary. What do we know about Mary? Well, she was a wealthy woman, right? No. She was having to well, do what no one would ever want to have to do to, to make it. This had to have been the most precious thing that she had. Besides the most valuable. There are lots of, of ideas of where it might have come from, how she might have come to have this. But for a woman who would have had very little, to have this and to just break that thing open and pour it all out over the head of Jesus, number one points out that she knew who he was. She had seen things that he had done. And she believed. And in her belief, she acted. She made this, this amazing sacrifice. Yeah, then Judas Iscariot. We go right from that. And, and how we could look at that as darkness too, right? Because Jesus is saying she was anointing him for burial, that she was getting him ready for his death, but Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went off to the chief priest in order to betray them, to betray him to them. And they were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money. And he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. Judas is getting ready. In chapter 11, verse 57, the chief priests put out a tip line. If anybody knew where he was, they wanted to know. They were looking for information. Whenever he shows up, because they thought he would probably show up, whenever he shows up, they wanted to know. Jesus had already told Judas, along with the other 11 and probably other disciples in that context, everything you have left will be repaid many fold. But that wasn't enough for him. He wanted something now. 
it's it's hard for me with with all the struggles that I have I've I've just never had that kind of greed in my heart and I can't imagine when something like that gets a grip on you that is that's tough Judas made the offer and the chief priests <laughs> offered money of course 30 pieces of silver. How much did each piece of silver weigh? I don't think we told. But they were coins. They're 30 silver coins of some kind, some denomination. And does it matter? Does it matter if every one of those was worth a million dollars a piece? Yeah. It won't. It won't in the end. I've, I've read scholars who have said that they really think that Judas may have been, you know, Jesus has already said he's going here to die, so he's probably just trying to expedite that. So what was the money about? I've heard that he was actually trying to accomplish the will of God, and I... I have such a hard time swallowing that. I don't, I don't see any indication of that. And they say, well, that's why he hung himself when, when, when Jesus died, because he never imagined that Jesus would die because he had this power. Jesus has told him that he was going to die, didn't he? Yeah, we have record of several times, and I can't imagine that we got the record of all of them. He had told Judas that he was going to die. So, eh, like I said, none of those theories to me held water. And the the men who I truly <laughs> admire and look up to as scholars, they they don't buy into that either. But the chief priests had money. Judas wanted money, and they both got what they wanted. Didn't work out for, well for either one of them, but they did. Well, beginning in verse 12, we have the last Passover here. We're going to read through verse 21. It says, now, on the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, the disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of the disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, and the teacher says, Where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Prepare for us there. And the disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had told them and prepared the Passover. Can we stop there for just one moment and say, do you remember the cult? When he said, go into town, find the man with the cult, tell him the Lord has need of it. And it happened exactly like he said. Is he trying to build their faith? We're pretty sure he wasn't trying to show off, right? He's trying to build them up. He's trying to get them ready. He's doing everything he can to, to build that up. So they prepared the Passover. Verse 17, when it was evening, he came with the 12. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, truly I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And they began to be grieved and said to him one by one, surely not I. And he said to them, it is one of the 12, one who dips with me in the bowl. For the Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for him, for that man, if he had not been born. Ooh. So we have the beginning of, of the Passover here. In verses 12 through 16, the disciples, and not any of the apostles apparently, because they were there, they prepared it, and Jesus and the 12 showed up later after it was all prepared. So they came to him and asked him, 
Did they ask him if he was going to participate in the Passover feast? No. What did they ask? Where? Anybody who has any doubt about Jesus being an observant, law-abiding Hebrew man, and this should pretty much alleviate that, they just asked him where. They wanted to get it ready. They needed a venue. They needed to, to gather the provisions, and they needed to prepare. And just as he said, it was. In verses 17 through 21, Jesus and the 12 were at table. Judas knows that Jesus knows now. Does this bring him to repentance? Does it, bring to, does it bring him to repentance that Jesus pointed out, it's one of you. It's one of the 12. It's the one who is dipping in the bowl with me. Did that bring him to repentance? What would have been? Yeah, me neither. I have no idea. But Job said that it would have been better that he had not been born. And God scorned him for that. Here we have Jesus pronouncing that for Judas, it would have been better that he had not been born. That's rough. That is... That is tough. It says when he, he says that one of them will betray him, that they became sorrowful. They began to be grieved. Not Judas particularly, I guess. For the other disciples, just they can't imagine that one of the other apostles is going to betray him. And it grieved them. And they started saying, well, it won't be me, and it won't be me, and it won't be me. And Jesus, basically, he flatly told them who it was going to be. That's rough. <laughs> I'm telling you. I, can't, I, I have had to, to, to admit to doing things and, and been called out on things before in my life, but I can't imagine that. I can't imagine sitting at the table beside Jesus, he had to have been beside him to be sharing that bowl <laughs> and have him point out that he knows what I'm going to do. Well, that would have been it for me. I, I would like to think anyway. I just curled up in a ball and cried. I can't imagine anything else to do. Ron? Gerald, real quick. Do you think you talked about Jesus not addressing that evil of Judas? Right then. Then. Is, I mean, his evil heart was going to end up being part of God's plan. Yeah. So. Yeah. He didn't address his evil heart at that point. And, and now we know even if he had it, it wouldn't have helped. But God used that evil to accomplish his plan. He used the evil of the, the mob. He used all those things together to accomplish everything that had been prophesied. Beginning in verse 22, we see the new arising from the old. It says, while they were eating, he took some bread. And after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them. And said, take, this is my body. And when he had taken the cup, given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will never drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The, the old Passover feast, the celebration of God's deliverance, deliverance from evil, but also deliverance from the angel that passed over and took the firstborn out of every Egyptian household. They were spared that by God. It's a celebration of a lot of things, but out of that celebration, Jesus takes the unleavened bread, which 
Why were they eating unleavened bread for the Passover? In a hurry. They were in a hurry. They didn't have time to let the bread rise twice. So they used unleavened bread in the Passover. Well, now they take that bread and Jesus said, this is my body. Talking about the flesh sacrifice. God from the beginning demanded a flesh sacrifice. And this was going to be the fulfillment of everything that those were pointing toward. Huh? I have noticed um, at this particular point through the scripture, they've been with him now for three years, and on more than one occasion, he has told them what is going to happen at, at the end. That he has to go up and he's going to give his life. And when we go back to verse 8, he said, She has anointed my body beforehand, for there is nobody says, When is that going to happen? He, they've been, he's been telling them for three years the process. What they do not get, even now, tonight is the last night they are going to be together. Well, they don't get that process, but I'm not sure they even got the death right. or the resurrection yet. Yeah. <laughs> and I think we have signs that they don't. But yet, he has been trying to get them ready for this for three years, but you know what? We're kind of thick sometimes. Sometimes it takes more. He's going to have to go through the whole thing and show them. Well, the next thing he says is, this is my blood. That is what? It's poured out. What did Paul say that he had already been? Like a drink offering. Poured out. What's the difference between the drink offering and every other sacrifice? If you go back through the sacrificial system, there was a sacrifice. The animal, the wheat, the whatever was brought. And those things were put on the altar. And what? Cooked. They were shared with the priest. They were shared with the family of the worshiper. There were different ones that were separated in different ways. But what happened with the drink offering? It was poured out entirely. There was no part that was for the worshiper. There was no part that was for the priest. It was an, a sacrifice entirely. When he says that his blood would be poured out, that's a reference to that sacrifice. That complete pouring out, that complete emptying, that giving everything. He says that this is the last meal before the new covenant is established, before the kingdom is established, eh, before all is accomplished. Why do we call what we eat on Sunday the Lord's Supper? Because Paul calls it that in 1 Corinthians, doesn't he? Why is it the Lord's Supper? Well, he instituted it. Well, but why is it the Lord's Supper? Everything about it is His. This bread is my flesh. This fruit of the vine is my blood. It's all about Him. So He takes this old Passover feast that God had instituted, that had brought to mind every year what God had done for them, bringing them up out of Egypt and all of that. And he takes it and makes it completely his. And I love that. And I love the, the seriousness with which the body here takes it. The fact that we... We don't just say a prayer. Not that that's wrong, and not that I'm condemning anyone for that, but the fact that we take a moment and we stop 
and it's talked about. I think that's, if we look back to the old covenant and we look at the feasts and we look at the things that they did, I think that's very fitting and I think it's, it's very biblical to do that. Beginning in verse 26, well, let's look at 26. I love this. After they did what? They sang a hymn. Twelve apostles, Jesus, sitting in this upper room, and they sang a hymn. I'm just going to leave that there and let y'all have that, but that's, to me, that is very meaningful. But it says, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, even though all fall away, yet I will not. <laughs> Verse 30, and Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. And Peter kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they were all saying the same thing also. Peter would die. Did he do anything that, that would indicate that later? When the temple guard was there, when there were trained soldiers there, and he pulls out a sword and goes after him. What is that? If that's not laying his life on the line, what is that? So he was willing to die. Ah, we'll go back to that in a second. Jesus said, you will all fall away. To the 12 men who'd been with him for three years, who had left everything to, to go with him and serve him. He said, you will all fall away. He says that that's fulfilling a, a prophecy. It's Zechariah 13, 7. And when y'all have a chance, go back and read Zechariah 13. And look at that prophecy in its entirety. And yeah, it should be able to be picked out as messianic without this being pointed out, but it Jesus points it out and quotes it. So Zechariah 13 is, yeah, so they were going to be scattered and that was going to fulfill the prophecy. And he says, I'll meet you at Galilee. I love that. He does too, doesn't he? On the shore, cooking up breakfast. Yeah. But now for Peter. He makes a statement of faith. And he's told by the Son of God that he will deny him three times. And he says, I'll be faithful to death. And he would have. But you know what he wasn't? He wasn't faithful in life. He was willing to die. I've all, often heard people say, well, you know, if somebody puts a gun to my head and says, tell me whether you're a Christian or not, I'll tell them I'm a Christian. And I was like, well, that's great. What if they're not holding a gun? You're willing to die. And so was Peter. He still fell short, though, didn't he? He said, you will deny me three times before the rooster crowed. And he didn't stop. Poor Peter. <laughs> he didn't stop. He couldn't stop. He couldn't stop insisting that that wasn't true. That what the Son of God had just said to him <laughs> was true. He couldn't accept it. He couldn't. And they all followed Peter. Verse 31, they, they all said the same thing. And y'all, that's where we're probably going to leave it for tonight. <laughs> but when we see this, yeah, maybe you've watched The Passion of the Christ. Maybe you've you know, seen some other theatrical. I just, I just can't imagine that it captures anything like what we have right here in the Word of God. So we're heading for Gethsemane week after next, Lord willing, we're singing next week. But over the next couple of weeks, I would challenge you to read from where we stopped tonight through to the end of Mark. 
several times. And y'all, this is, oh, this is the season that most in the world are going to be celebrating the birth of Jesus. Probably the wrong time of year. It's not anything that's commanded or even pointed out in scripture. But y'all, all the time is the time we need to be celebrating the sacrifice, the flesh and the blood that he gave so that we can have life. Thank you all.